Roll it. We're rolling. All right. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Vegas Legal Magazine podcast. I'm Mark Fierro. I'm here with the editor of Vegas Legal. Tyler Morgan. And Vice President of Fierro Communications, Jeff Haney. Say hello, Jeff. Hello, Jeff. we got Nerdy Purdy on the board with us today. And more importantly, this is uh, real serious stuff. We're talking about one of the most contentious areas of the law, controversial areas, uh, particularly of the last six months. But today, a long time uh, Las Vegas attorney has been a steady voice, decades of experience in immigration. Ava Men Garcia Mendoza, thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Mark. I want to start with a little story. It seemed like such a short time ago when the President of the United States said, and I quote, I believe in the idea of amnesty for those who have put down roots, who have lived here, even though some time back they may have entered illegally. And that president wasn't Barack Obama, it was Ronald Reagan. My, how things have changed. Yes, Ronald Reagan actually is the one that came in with that amnesty program that we had uh, in 1986. So when people now, today, when they come to your office, how have their how have their concerns changed? What is it that they're afraid of? Their concern is that they're going to be arrested. For example, yesterday I had a young man that a uh, process server had been to his house and left a little red card and said and put a, had a case number on it and it was Sheriff Civil Bureau. And he comes to me and he says, "I'm a dreamer. Am I going to get arrested?" And I said, "Arrested for what?" And he says, "I don't know. I can't afford to get arrested." And I said, "I know that you're a dreamer." But he says, "They're looking for me." And I look at it, I said, "This is civil." I said, I don't know, somebody's suing you or somebody's got you in court, but it has nothing to do with criminal. And I said, just go over there and tell them that you'll accept service and they're going to give you whatever they wanted to serve you with. And he was so scared to death. He came back to my office two hours later and goes, oh, it was just this. But, you know, they're afraid uh, of yeah. any, anything that right. might get them in trouble with the law. And th this is a perfect setting for some people to really take advantage, too, of immigrants as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I have seen over the years, not just now, but in my 36 years as an attorney, so many people, and, and the unfortunate thing is most of the people in your own community, whether you be Bulgarian or Greek or Mediterranean or Latino, you'll have these people that put up a cardboard sign or a sign that'll say, no to Republic or we help you with immigration matters, or not lawyers. And some of them will just fly into town for the weekend. Somehow they'll advertise, like you said, in a, in a local ethnic newspaper. And they go in and pay these people thousands of dollars, and then the people just disappear. And they don't know what they apply for. They never get a receipt. They never get anything. They're victimized by the people that they trusted the most. You know, I, for, I, worked, I worked for Congress, and we used, to, we used to hear this all the time, and you just want to pull your hair out. Why don't they just do this legally? So tell us, a non-skilled worker or a low-skilled worker in Mexico who wants to come to the United States and he's going to stand in line and he's going to do this legally. He makes application. When does he get here legally? Well, first of all, there's no application to make. There's no such category unless he has a United States citizen, parent, spouse, or child over the age of 21. He cannot immigrate through a relative. And so then the other alternative is to immigrate um, through an employment-based immigration. And if you don't have money to set up your own business and you don't have a university degree, then if you're simply an unskilled worker, you have to find an employer that wants to hire you. And that employer has to do this application called a labor certification. The employer has to test the labor market, put ads on the company's website, put ads at the state employment office and wherever else they tell us to put ads on. And then he has to interview and uh, review all the resumes that he gets, interview the people that applied that, that meet the minimum qualifications. And if there's one American that meets the minimum qualifications, this low-skilled Mexican that said, I just want to work, is out. Assuming that there's nobody that qualifies, uh, the low-skilled worker, who, by the way, cannot wait in the United States for that, cannot get a uh, work permit, he has to wait in Mexico. And then there's a waiting list. It's called a <clears throat> priority list that the that the Department of State puts out every month. It's called the Visa Bulletin, and you look for your category, and you see, okay, where is Mexico on this priority list? It may be 25 years away. So by that time, the employer will be gone and say, well, I'm no longer here, or I sold it, or I no longer have a position open for you. So it's, it's really pointless. And the same is true for um, relatives. Say, say you have a mother who's a permanent resident that applies for her child. Um, the child has to remain 
unmarried. If the child marries, he loses that visa. Then if, if the mother applies after, after the mother is a U.S. citizen and the child is now a married child, you know the priority date is over 20 years away. So the shorthand for that is the next time you hear somebody arguing saying, why can't these Mexicans just do this legally? The answer is what you're saying is it's a load. It's a fiction. There is no legal route for them. And that's the whole issue that presidents since Reagan and there's before no, him. There's no line to get there's no understanding. Well, everybody says, my relatives waited in line, why can't they? They didn't wait in line. It was a whole different system. There was no quotas then like we have now. I mean, there used to be in the, in the start of the 19th century, there was quotas for the Chinese, for example, when, when there was discrimination against them, and then they couldn't come in. Because that's where it all started, isn't it? When the Chinese, when they were putting the quotas on the Chinese, that's how this whole like, quota system even began, yeah, right? I believe so, yes. So you mentioned, so going back to what you were saying, you were mentioning that the employer has to sponsor you, but they have to, there can't be another American that fits your qualifications for the job. Now that American, does that American have to actually want the job, or do they just have to declare that there's people ready, willing, and able that are already citizens that can do that job, and therefore... What? Yeah, the American, well, the American submits an application, so it means he wants the job. Okay, so you, yeah. there just can't be anybody that's a citizen competing for that position. A citizen or a permanent resident, yeah, because okay. you have to submit all that documentation back to the uh, to the uh, employment offices, the Department of Labor, and then to the uh, to the United States Citizenship and Immigration Services, and to prove to them that look, here's all of the resumes I got, and nobody minimum, minimally qualifies, and then they can come back and second guess you and say, well, I think this one does, you lose. So, and what happens in the contrary if, say, I'm coming in from. Country I'm immigrating into here, but I have money and I want to open up a business. I want to open up a, I don't know, a dry cleaner or whatever it might be with my family. How does that process differ from the unskilled labor worker that just wants to come in and get citizenship? Well, that's that's not an immigrant visa. That's a work visa, okay. and it's called the investor visa. Like an EB five. It's an E two. Okay. An EB five is an immigrant that leads to a permanent residence green card. Uh huh. But the investor visa allows you to be here for as long as you, you know, are allowed to be here, and you can renew those applications. But you have to be uh, have a substantial investment in the business, and you have to manage the business. And the goal is not to be self-employment, so they want you hiring Americans. You okay. have to submit a business plan, and you have to show that the money that came in was clean. So you have to show where the money came from. It's got to be wired and those kinds yeah. of things. Interesting. Is there any protection when somebody, some, somebody comes here, say they come here from... Uh, the obvious. Uh, so they come from Mexico, and and they are gainfully employed. They seek out education. They're young. They attend college. They're doing all of the right things. When it, when push comes to shove, it, does that help them in any way in the eyes of immigration? Well, the problem is they entered illegally, so there's still no category for them because they entered illegally, so they wouldn't be able to get any of the work visas that we were just talking about. The only thing they would be able to do is to marry an American, or have a parent or a child over the age of 21 an American, have them file the paperwork, then they would have to go back to Mexico to the American consulate for the interview, and then come back. I, I do want to put this in perspective, because I do think that there's a lot of misinformation and intentional disinformation out there as well. I think if you listen to, to the um, the presidential um, race, it sounded as if all of this is from Trump, that it's exclusively from Trump. He added the icing to the cake. But the truth is, is that Obama was very hard on uh, deportation. Uh, ABC News reports that between 2009 and 2015, the Obama administration, this is a quote, removed more than 2.5 million people through immigration orders, and that doesn't include the number of people who self-deported or were turned away or returned to their home country at the border by U.S. Customs and Border Protection, end quote from ABC News. So what has changed? How has it gotten more draconian? It it's, it's just the rhetoric. Um, the rhetoric has been amplified, uh, whereas before, uh, everybody knew the laws were there, but they weren't always enforced. The officers had a lot of discretion. For example, they were allowed to do what's called prosecutorial discretion. So they would arrest you, and you're the mother, and you've got two little kids, and the kids were born here or weren't born here, either way. And they're going to say, okay, we're going to let you go. Uh, but you've got to report here every six months. Uh, but we just want to make sure you stay out of trouble, and we're going to leave you alone. We're not going to disturb the family. Now, um, as of the beginning of this year, 
President Trump got rid of that prosecutorial discretion. He says everybody will be prosecuted and we're going to try to kick everybody out. Now, the good news is for the people that, that want us to get control of the borders, and I think all of us want to get control of the borders, it's not that we don't, but, um, but if you get control of the borders, then the people are stopped, they're not coming, coming in, they're hearing these terrible stories, and, and so what was happening, like you keep talking about the Mexicans, Mark, but in the last few years, the biggest number of, of uh, undocumented coming through the borders are the Central Americans. Because they're fleeing, they're, they're fleeing the wars, they're fleeing, fleeing, yeah. fleeing violations from the uh, committed by the gang members and those kinds of things, and so now they're not coming. I was reading this morning, you know, um, the number of people attempting to enter illegally is All -time low. substantially. Low. It's it's a 17 year low. Really? Yes. Yeah. You never hear that in the news. And it and it has been drifting down since Obama. This is not entirely Trump's doing. It it has it has I've heard that. drifted down. But, and Here, I hear that, but it sounds like. ICE agents are all over the communities and stuff, just are. looking for people to pull over for a traffic they've violation taken, and then just kick them out. They've taken people off of uh, off of uh, hospital ventilators. They've ta they've gone to extraordinary. Here's something interesting. This just today from the Wall Street Journal: Homeland Security Secretary doesn't see building a solid wall along U.S.-Mexico border. Now, there's a guy that mm -hmm. probably would listen to Trump if it made sense, but obviously. <laughs> <laughs> Some people think otherwise. The other thing is, you could forget this whole thought. We everybody, uh, you just naturally do it. They're going to build a wall. Nobody's going to build a wall. Nobody on earth, except Donald Trump, believes that there's going to be a wall, even one wall, because even immigration, even ICE people say they need a fence. They want to be able to see through it. They want to see what's going on. So this whole notion that there's going to be something different than what there is, is baloney to start with. Oh, yeah. It's in the billions What's of dollars. going to build like the Great Wall of the well, U.S. Well, you know, yeah. we have a thousand miles, I believe it's a thousand miles, of river that's shared between the U.S. and Mexico. If we build the wall, so so we own up to the middle of the river and Mexico owns up to the other middle, uh, the other half. If we build the wall, we're giving up the river. Yeah, <laughs> so there's that. Uh, <laughs> and, then, and, then, yeah. and then there's, I don't know how many, how many uh, miles of uh, Indian land. They can't build a wall in Indian land. And there's a lot of private property, but golf courses, one but of the other golf is, courses. The whole idea behind the wall is trying to keep the criminals out that are trying to come in here and, and transport drugs and everything. But they're all going underneath the fences and what would soon to be a wall anyway. Well, but, although funnels. they're going to try to address that by digging deeper. Yeah, and so they'll The footage deeper. will be five feet deep. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I just read one of the most interesting books I've read in, uh, in years. And that is, uh, it's called Dreamland. It's by former Los Angeles Times reporter Sam Quinones. It's an incredible story. And what he talks about is the current uh, heroin epidemic began with Oxycontin. Now, we've been talking about some good Mexican nationals who are just here to make a living. Uh, but uh, when, and I have to tell you that when Trump said, you know, they're bad people, they're rapists and they're bringing drugs into this country. Bad I, yeah, I just thought it was just, you know, more of the same from him and the, his usual typical level of discourse. But the truth is, is that uh, the overwhelming majority of black tar heroin was distributed virtually exclusively by Mexican illegal males. They used an ingenious, very consumer-friendly, non-threatening delivery model it, and delivering black tar heroin they literally made it cheaper than buying a pizza. And the mistake, I think, in retrospect, that everyone recognizes now is they would see these young guys. They had obviously never been in any trouble with the law before. You take one look at them. You knew they weren't using drugs. They had anything to do with drugs and the fact that they were selling these drugs. And they would say, these are not bad people, and they'd just simply deport them. Well, that was a huge mistake because then the next guys would come in saying, well, what are they going to do, slap your hands or not going to slap your hands? And as a result... The one area of Mexico that has absolutely confounded all DEA efforts, and that is black tar heroin, which, by the way, and that this is the exclusive purview of these Mexican gangs, that they, the heroin has killed, as of late, has killed more people than uh, crack cocaine and meth combined. So there is a problem there, and, and I don't know, you know, th this only makes your job a thousand times harder with dealing with honest people who have no intent of ever breaking the law. But it is a stain on every single person. It's a it, it's huge, huge, huge error. Well, there's no question, and, and I think, you know, the, the other thing is that you said they were turning them around without prosecuting them. Without I mean, these, these are drug dealers. Yeah. They, they're prosecuting. They should get 20 years in prison. And that would have ended it. 
there never would have been the heroin epidemic. They just looked so young, they looked so innocent, and they were innocent, uh, but for the fact that they were delivering these things, and they, they would they would now, literally so, drive so, around with a mouthful of balloons of heroin. So if, if these people, these sellers, or heroin dealers are under the age of 18, well, that's the best way, because you put them in the juvenile system, and then you're Bounce off. right out. Huh? So maybe they were treated differently because they were, of their youth. Who comes to the door to these days to you? Who comes to your office now? Who's the typical? I have everything. I have, um, the other day I had an Uber driver. He's a, phys uh, he's a physician, a specialist, an ear, nose, and throat doctor. Uh, but he doesn't have a visa to be here. How long has he been here? He's studying for his uh, exam to see if he can get licensed in this country, but once he gets licensed in this country, you know, we still got to find a way to keep him here. So what he did is he married. See, he really is smart. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, but I have, I've had this client that I've had for 36 years, and he came to see me the other day. He's, he's a handyman. He's got his own business. He's got these big trucks. He probably employs about 10 people. And he said, what's going to happen to me? Mm. 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 Uh, I have another guy who's a, who's a wholesale uh, liquor salesman. And I said, does anybody know that you're undocumented? He says, no. No, no. There's a lot of business owners that are undocumented that people don't know about. Well, there's also... And they're not just Mexicans, Mark. I mean, I have clients from all over the world. Sure, sure. So, um, it's just the Mexicans come in without a visa, or a lot of them came in without a visa, whereas the other ones came with a visa and then stayed. And the other thing is, uh, what a lot of people don't know is, I was reading this out the other day, is I think in 2015, undocumented citizens accounted for $14 billion in taxes. And so they pay their taxes. And don't forget this. This is you, I'm so glad that you said this. Yeah. Think about this for a second. So an illegal shows up. They are going to use a false identification. Right? They dig up this identification, and uh, they present this fake ID to their new employer. The new employer hires them. They've got a fake social security number, and they work with them for ten years. That money stays in social security, never gets paid out because there's nobody to pay it out to. Mm -hmm. It's always been an assumed, it just keeps getting paid in. The United States, it may very well be that Social Security. When They're paying their about, taxes and everything, they exactly, get zero benefit from exactly. it. it, it there, is, there is a story, and the story is, and I see it on Facebook more often the, the, as of late, I think it has everything to do with the kind of discourse that came out of the presidential campaign. But basically it's this, oh good, I went to Lowe's the other day, I went to U-Haul the other day, and there's no Mexican standing out in front, you know, trying to get trying to get work. I get some bad news. If you like to eat, okay, that same thing is happening in farms all over the San Fernando Valley in California, which is the breadbasket of the United States. If you want to read something chilling, go to the agricultural reports and look at the crisis that's going on in hiring. And, you know, it, it could very well be that with a couple of bad weeks of either losing them because they withhold their work, they go on strike, or that they ship out just enough of them, the United States is going to be in a real, real problem food-wise. Now, the San Joaquin Valley and the Imperial Valley in California, I mean, they produce not only for our country, but for many other countries. San Joaquin is the single biggest yeah. uh, producer of food in the United States. You think of the, mid middle of the Midwest, and that's what comes to mind. Ain't so. Yeah. Yeah. Just going up from LA right on all the way through the northern part of the state. That is the breadbasket. Yeah. The and everyone States. just in society is so caught up with the idea of mass Im mass amounts of immigrants coming in and taking jobs, and they somehow have them categorized all as criminals and sneaking in here but and not belonging. But at the end of the day, they're paying their taxes. But here's they're the working. hypocrisy. Everyone that is complaining about them, just yeah. like we had many years ago with uh, former President Bush who wanted to appoint Linda Chavez uh, to one of the cabinet positions and found out she had an undocumented nanny. Right. They all do. Yeah. Yeah. And so I say to them, well, who's your gardener? Who's your nanny? Well, they're different, but I want everybody else out. And I said, well, it doesn't work that way. <laughs> <laughs> everybody, it's, it's, more, it's really more of a criminal problem that we have with the drugs flowing in, the fear of terrorism. But They've you know sort what? of taken every immigrant that's undocumented and sort of pulled them all together in the same category. But you know what Mexico says? Want. Mexican president says, if America didn't have that appetite for drugs, we wouldn't be sending them up there. We wouldn't have yeah. the drug problem that we have in Mexico if the Americans didn't have that appetite. So why doesn't the U.S. crack down on that? Fear makes an idiot of every man. It really does. You, you start running around in circles, and, and if you don't have that fear in your heart, 
but you have someone shouting from the hilltops, it's time to be afraid. Panic is has a way of, of spreading like a plague faster than anything else. This is McCarthyism all over again. All over again. And you know, it's important to point out, this is, just remember this, folks. When, you know, from a political perspective, you know, Hitler didn't go after the Jews because that was his mortal enemy. The Russians aren't going after gays because all of a sudden there's a big gay issue. And we're not going after Mexicans because Mexicans are taking over the world. It, it's easiest to go after the weakest group possible who can't fight back. And then when the Russian authorities say, why are you sticking up for this gay person? Are you gay? Well, that's what turns the tide. That second level of generation, that's what turns the tide. And, you know, I've I'm, I'm never been a big fan of, of um, Reagan or, or what he did or what he did to the deficit. If you don't know, look it up because it exploded under Reagan. Um, but this is the truth. He asked a question. Are great numbers of our unemployed really victims of the illegal alien invasion or are those illegal tourists actually doing work our own people won't do? President Reagan continued, quote, one thing is certain in this hungry world, no regulation or law should be allowed if it results in crops rotting in the field for lack of harvesters. Again, the words of then President Ronald Reagan. And here we are, here we are. The only difference is instead of trying to sell reason and trying to sell a vision of hope or a vision of a, a pathway that, that, that makes sense for everybody, a way to find a win-win. Now we're sowing seeds of terror. That that's, this is what's wrong with the country. And by the way, this may be the only thing wrong with the country. Well, they're the soup of the day because they're the least power. But then on top of that, everybody wants to argue that, oh, we're a free market and we should be able to you know, employ and distribute as we want and hire the people we want, but we're going to put caps on the people that we can let into the country now and who can stay and so forth. There's a, there's a woman, a, her name's Julissa Ars. I don't know if you've heard her or anything. She's the, I think she's like a VP at Goldman Sachs. She came in as an undocumented immigrant, um, ended up, I think she went to like Harvard Business School and everything rose to the ladder, now she's a VP of Goldman Sachs and everything, and she came up with a book and everything, but recently with all this, you know, Trump uh, dialogue about, you know, deporting everybody, she came out, she's been on a lot of interviews talking about how there's more valedictorians, doctors, Navy SEALs, um, people doing great work that are competing in the market, that are making the country unquestionably better because of their service and the work that they do and it's just it's unreal and she's lived in fear working and studying and doing everything until she finally got married and now she can freely come out because she doesn't have that fear of being deported but it's uh it's amazing i just can't get over how many people think that the immigrants are all just bad people and we yeah get them i mean out and pursuant to that political discussion. There was um, a new paper that was just presented at the Brookings Institution, Brookings Institution we were just looking at, that seems to suggest that the, the, whole, the whole premise of the immigration debate is when you talk about border walls and, and mass deportations, they simply call it anach anachronistic. They say that that line of thinking is out of date for a number of reasons, not the least of which the the flow of undocumented people into the U.S. has slowed dramatically over the last 10 years to essentially, I believe, net, net zero income um, for a number of reasons. It's the lowest in 17 years. And that's because people are, there. well, we mentioned that uh, deportations have been going on since 2007, so that's nothing new. Um, so some people trying, um, opting to move, to move back out of the United States to, the, to, their, to their homeland. And um, perhaps things like more, with, even without building a new wall, they have uh, still, I believe it said, uh, quintupled the number of border agents since the 1990s, um, in addition to um, newer technologies to track and catch people coming across the border. So there's a, a variety of reasons why immigration has slowed drastically 
um, in recent years. And they're they're putting over those uh, border patrol agents. They're putting them on the payroll without completely vetting them because all of them are supposed to take polygraph tests and, and go through that. A lot of them can't pass the polygraph um, because of the way they ask the questions or something. But I mean, these uh, border patrol agents could be in, uh, infiltrated from other countries, sent by other countries. Who knows? Because, but they're putting them on so fast, and they actually caught something. Said you didn't really want to work. You just wanted to see how we operate. Because they're adding so many yes. so quickly. So quickly, yes. that's yes. what happens to quality. There's a New York Times story regarding the San Joaquin Valley, um, and it was saying that in the political analysis that uh, the New York Times says, quote, that these farmers bet their farms in the election of Donald J. Trump. As for his promise about cracking down on illegal immigrants, many assume Trump's pledges were mostly just talk. But two weeks into his administration, this was a month ago, obviously, Trump's designed executive orders upended the country's immigration laws. Now, farmers here are deeply alarmed about what these new policies could mean for their workers, most of whom are unauthorized, and the businesses that depend on them. Mr. Trump would know that farmers invested millions of dollars in the produce that is now growing right now. Not being able to pick and sell those crops would represent huge losses for the state economy. Quote, I'm confident he can grasp the magnitude and anxiety of what's happening now. Well, the good news for them is they got exactly what they asked for. They wanted to go out of business. I guess they could go out of business. That's on them. That's the great thing about America. You get what you vote for. And so they didn't take him at his word. Well, I guess they could lose their farms that have been their family for generations. And But the broader question for us is, who's going to pick these crops? What are we going to do? We know that that Caucasians show up and quit or get fired in the first shift. What do you think? What is it? That, what's the capacity to fix this? Well, you know, Mark, um, I grew up in South Texas, seven miles from the border, and we used to have labor camps around where we lived, and that's what they would do: is they would go and recruit men in Mexico, and bring them over to do the farm worker work, and when they were done, send them back. And it's like there are just disposable things like a, you know, a napkin that you finish using it and send them back. But you're talking about human beings. You just can't be doing that. You have to give them, you know, first of all, you're separating them from their families and their children. And then you're using them and saying, okay, you got to go back. You're uprooting them. I mean, these are human beings. You have to treat them humanely. Now, we do have a, a, a visa program here called the H-2A, and, it's, and they allow people to come in from other countries just to come in for the seasons like uh, lobster fishing, working uh, in Dis Epcot Center or during the summer season or doing the strawberries or something. But it, it really is, is inadequate because our need is so high and, and the immigration lawyers get rich on doing these kinds of visas as it is and now if you're going to do millions of people it's going to be crazy. It, it, it'll make the, no, but on the, seasonal the business ones, people are they still poor. Are the seasonal visas still victim to the quotas and everything? They can only country. come in for nine months, they can come in for a year or 18 months, whatever the program is, and then they got to leave. Um, and what happens is they come in here and I've met a lot of these young people that like, come in and work the, the camps. Mm -hmm. that, you know, I, I have this uh, a uh, friend who works summer camps up there near Philadelphia, and he's met the kids from all over the world that come in and work the summer camp. But they, they like it here, and then they want to stay. These are tough times, and you know, I, you always feel in the back of your mind the idea that there's some justice. You know, when, when, you, when you're back east and you look through all the south and you see the old, the old south, you see these magnificent homes and things like walls, you know, like a four foot wall that it doesn't keep cattle out or animals in or anything. It's too small to have done that three-foot wall. But it goes on for miles. Well, the reason that wall's there is because it was built by human beings that they owned, that they didn't have to pay anything. And and I think when you, when you look at California, you look at the circumstances that those people are essentially slaving under. They're being exposed to incredibly powerful pesticides that don't wash up. That's why Mexican workers have their all the way down to their wrists, no matter how hot it is. In the blazing sun, you know, there's there is a comeuppance. There's a there's a bill to pay for that sooner or later. I just to me it just it doesn't seem right. Now I will tell you this, that and and this is just me from my heart of hearts because I you know I when I see uh, a crime committed against a woman, against uh, a senior, against a child. 
I see spray painting on the wall. I say, you know what? Never come to this country again. You know, do your time here. Do your five years. Do whatever it takes. And then leave. And then never come back. Uh, but the idea that that we it, it would be it would be completely different uh, if, as if you say, we weren't inviting them. We weren't enticing them. There's gold on one side of the room and nothing on the other. Of course any human being is going to try and better their lives and go where the gold is, go where the money is. Uh, we invite them. It's hypocrisy. It's, it, if we were just saying, you stay on your side and we'll stay on ours, that would be different. That I get. That's not what's going on. We're holding up bags of money and saying, come over here and then after that we'll just see how it works out. We're not going to lift a finger to make your life. But, but that's of course work. sort of the American entitlement, the, the, the feeling of entitlement is sort of creating that opportunity for a lot of immigrants to come in because as Americans many of us think that we're just, we're supposed to go to school and just be given a job or the government's supposed to create a job for us. So if somebody else is coming into the country, you know, be it illegally, then we think that they're just immediately taking a job that we otherwise would have. You never actually think whether you actually want the job as you said earlier. And um, we're getting to that point in time where the government just can't make jobs. I mean, the biggest job stealer is Silicon Valley. You know, automation is taking all the jobs away. It's not people coming through the borders that want to work in labor-intensive jobs and things like that. So, you know, I, my personal view is if they want to come in here and they want to work hard and they want to create an opportunity, you know, put them on the field with the rest of us. Well, take a look at who created Silicon Valley. Who yeah. created Silicon Valley? Uh, it's all the immigrants. All immigrants. You know? India. Now, Most of our medical Pakistan. community is, is yeah. all made up of immigrants, you, too. Now, do you know, the country. Have you ever heard of the H-1B visa? The H-1B sure. visas are for people with university degrees who come into the U.S. to do jobs in the field of their education. 70% um, of those H-1B visas are going to people from India. And so Trump yesterday, um, because April 1 was the first day that you could start applying uh, for an H-1B visa for the new fiscal year, he gave notice to the employers that they're going to come, they're going to do uh, raids or inspections on these businesses that have applied, and they said, if we find out that you are um, favoring the immigrants over the Americans, there's going to be hell to pay if you did that because you're using an H-1B visa in, in lieu of hiring an American. So now he's threatening the business community that way. But the question is, is there an American that could do that tech-specific job or that? You know that specialty that somebody in India learned or from elsewhere. It may not be. That, that's the other thing is we've You're had this. Downgrade we've had the this workforce policy memo times. that we've been working under for 20 years about information technology and computer fields. Uh, yesterday we, we uh, they put out a memorandum once again Department of uh, Homeland Security excuse me uh, DHS yes and they said uh, we're scrapping that memo. Uh, we're reevaluating re whether we want to bring in computer programmers and people in the computer field. And, and you know that what will happen, I mean, business is very, very smart, and what will happen is they'll just immediately offshore that business and we'll lose the tax base and we'll lose all of the American jobs because it'll be across the border in either Texas or Canada. I have a and funny problem I, solved. I have a funny anecdote. Uh, um, one of my assistants called uh, USCIS. We, we wanted to know about a particular client because something wasn't happening. They weren't uh, answering our, our letters and uh, we needed to have a response to something that we had applied for. So it says, we'll call this 1-800 number. It was in India. <laughs> the U.S. government is outsourcing the immigration questions to India. <laughs> my, my assistant finally got somebody hung up. <laughs> yeah, and, and just remember, just so that we put this in perspective, when, when it's not a knee-jerk reaction, when it's not an emotional response to a complex question, what you find is that the, the vast majority of these jobs were not lost to any group, there's not some country that we lost them to, it's automation. You know, yeah. Trump, Trump talks about bringing jobs back in, in coal, it's just becoming one of the most rapidly automated industries and it's a shrinking industry on top of that. Yeah. There are no jobs that are going to be coming in coal, they have trucks that drive themselves now, they have computers that, that sniff out the coal and there's not little guys with hard hats and well, picks on the they used to. Detroit used to employ all those people to build the cars. Now, have you ever seen anybody build a car? It doesn't happen. There's all those robots and everything building everything. You know, I think you program the robot. That's the job. That's the job. That's yeah, available. that's it. So one, you know, 
thousands of people. So we have to reeducate our workforce. Yeah. One, yeah. Which is why well, I wish it was that easy just to say because it's just about that's going to be an endeavor. Possible. And in particularly if you think that you're going to get the government to retrain those workers because people just don't change their stripes and it's not a matter of months, it's years and yeah. years and years. We have to raise the next generation with ambition to create, you know, a career. They need to create employment. They need to provide something that's going to just stand them out and away from everybody else. Otherwise, you know, you're running out of slots to fill that people could just jump into and just work, you know. Well, as far as the idea of undocumented people being business owners and taxpayers mm -hmm. and, and accomplished people, this really struck me. Apparently, in the year 1980, the most common age of a Mexican-born person living in the United States was 20 years old. Today, the most common age of a Mexican-born person living in the U.S. is 40 years old. And by the year 2040, that number will be 70 years old. I mean, that just really struck me. Uh, the, the takeaway there is that the undocumented population in the U.S. is no longer young and itinerant. I mean, that's, and I believe that's definitely contrary to what many people out there believe and the way the, the whole immigration debate is being approached. Is that your understanding as well, Eva? Yes, yes, absolutely. But you're also seeing, because countries like Mexico are, are moving up uh, economically and educationally. So, yeah, there's more so and better no jobs reason, in Mexico no every reason year. for them to, to leave their country. Remember this, that for much of the Mexican middle class, what there is of it, their children go to private school and they're in school six days a week. So you want to put their education up against our education. Once they can make it to the middle class, there's, there's you know, an educational system in place and, and it is, is quite strong. Um, the United States, I think, I think we're at something of a crossroads and people are going to have to learn to, to anticipate what's next. You talk about these, you talk about 11 million, is that the number that's being tossed around that they say? Or 15 million. 15 million that are going to be, that we're going to find a way to kick, them out, yeah. kick them out of the country. And, that, and, you, and you, have to, you have to remember what a pivotal role they play in so many of the jobs. You can, you can watch any construction site out here. Now, you will say, well, Caucasian worker, American worker could do that job. Let's see him do it when it's 120 degrees. I mean, there are some guys out there that, that are some tough, tough guys, and they'll hang with those guys. But a lot of the people that will, that will do that work and do it day in and day out, and you come back to the job site, because a lot of it is piece work, they'll come back to the job site at 9 o'clock at night, and they're still out there hammering. Are, are, are Mexican nationals that are they're here yeah, just to is, work? It's, you just, something occurred to me when you were saying that is, and just thinking back on this whole conversation today, is it's sort of sad, but we keep wanting to refer to the undocumented citizens as Mexicans, but there are so many that are coming from Europe, China, Canada, South America, uh, the island countries, I mean, all over that are undocumented, and it's, it's the same thing. Take a look at all the kiosks and all the uh, major shopping centers on the Strip. Who runs those kiosks? Yeah. Israeli kids. Yeah. Yeah, so they, don't, they don't have permission yeah. to work. None of them. No. And there's so many people just fleeing here to get out of war-torn countries. I mean, well, that's you want to just settle back? It's a whole different issue. Yeah. Yes. I mean, what happened to Syria yesterday with the sarin gas? Like, yeah. The pointing of fingers, I think, is is the takeaway here. It's it's who we blame and what we blame them for, and I think. Part of you know, if you do any reading on this at all, is there's so much more to it, and it's not there's there isn't a legal line that they can get in. They didn't choose to do this illegally. None of these people chose to do it illegally. As you said, people in Central America they didn't think it was just a great idea to suddenly go to the United States. A lot of them are children. Their parents walk them all the way through Mexico, take buses all the way through Mexico. To save their lives, so they don't get caught up in this yeah. these horrible government crossfires, the drug gangs, these crossfires that happen, and they, and it's only natural that they would try to get here. I agree. You know, when it comes to people who have broken the law, who are come here to specifically break the law, 
I got no problem. Send them, send them to prison and then send them back. But the vast majority, that's simply not them. That's not who we're talking about. It's not who we're talking about. No. What, what, so today, what can a person who is, say they are gainfully employed and they're in the United States, they don't have uh, their necessary paperwork, what can they do? Is there something that you can do for them today? Well, unfortunately, they've changed the law. If you get caught <coughs> by immigration and you get put in deportation proceedings, which means you get a chance to see an immigration judge, the judge asks, well, what kind of remedy are you going to ask for? So what do you qualify for? If you've been living in this country for at least 10 years and you've been good, clean, uh, paid your taxes, not collected welfare, food stamps, <coughs> and you have U.S. citizen children, um, primarily over the age of 11, who we can show will suffer extreme and unusual hardship if your parent is deported, then you can stay here. But if your child is two or three years old, you don't win that case because um, the way they analyze it, the kid doesn't know if he's here, if he's in India, or he's in Timbuktu. So he's not, that child is not going to suffer. But once the child gets of age, then they're going to know the difference. And not only that, did you know that if you have an American-born child of a Mexican citizen and the Mexican citizen is deported, takes the children back with them to Mexico, they have a very, very difficult time trying to enroll in the school system, in the public school system there, because they're not Mexicans. So now they have to get their Mexican citizenship, and that takes time. And sometimes these kids lose like a year. Like a person without a country for a while. No. Yeah. Yeah. So what was your, let me ask you, um, I'm sure everybody wants to know, the, the executive order that went out not too long ago, when that came out, what was your what was your impression? Because I know I had some immigration attorney friends of mine that were just running into the Constitution and they were pulling out the, uh, was the Immigration National Nationalization Act of, I think, 70, 69 or? 52. Or 52, yeah. okay. And they were just an uproar of the constitutionality of it. But what are the constitutional rights behind the immigrants that are coming in? And then, I mean, can we just ban countries from allowing anybody in? I mean, no. can we really do that? No. You can't ban them based on the reasons that Trump said. And, uh, it's, and, every, and you know, we hear about the case out of Washington, D uh, excuse me, Washington State. We hear about the case out of uh, Hawaii. But there were like five or six other courts in other states, other jurisdictions. There was in Boston, there was in New York, uh, there was in Virginia, uh, in Kansas. All of them also said, you cannot enforce it. This is, this is unconstitutional, the executive order. Yeah. yeah. And they went back to intent right away. I thought that was really, that was just brilliant. They said, oh no, you said on this date what you were trying to do. You're trying to keep Muslims out of the country. <laughs> I don't yeah, yeah, Trump yeah, yeah, about yeah, Muslims. Yeah. Oh, I didn't really mean that. Yeah, yeah. but something completely different. Here, you know, which begs this begs the question, and and um, this is obviously political, and it, and it looks at kind of a broader view, not just as an immigration attorney, but as an officer of the court. How does it make you feel when you're the president of the United States talking about quote? so-called judges and talk, discusses the breakup of the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals? Well, that's, that's two completely different subjects, Marco. They've been talking about breaking up the Ninth Circuit for a long time, so that, that doesn't go hand in hand with disrespecting the judges. But in the context of a decision that he didn't like, it does. <laughs> yes. Well, it, you're talking about the judge out of uh, San Diego sure. uh, on his own case at Trump course. University yeah, sure. uh, that he has disrespected and humiliated. And the judges, they can't talk about cases that are, that are before them. Uh, and so they have to keep quiet. Somebody else has to advocate for them. But never in my life and in the history of this country have I seen the disrespect of judges. This kind of, it's like tyranny. It's like, and, and I have this one so friend of mine. So-called judges. So-called, a uh, friend of mine says, why does a judge have the right to overturn what Trump wants, <laughs> what the president wants. And I said, it's just a piece of paper. It's called the separation of powers. It's called checks and balances. Yeah. That's why the, con the, it's framers, that pesky constitution. the framers set up the Constitution the way they did. We didn't want an oligarch. We didn't want a dictator. Because the very first thing that you do is you go after the referee. You remove him. You teach all the other referees to toe the line or else. That's the next step. That's always the next step. So well, everybody thinks the president can just do whatever he wants. And then, 
now the president thinks he can do whatever he wants and he's sort of realizing that he can't. But to just, I mean, to come down on judges and to question their uh, credentials and their ability to, you know. You know, as a, um, translate the law an officer of the court, which I am, I cannot go out, if I'm unhappy with the judge's decision, I can't walk outside and give a press conference and, and call that judge names. You can't do that. I mean, the state bar would be on my back so and you, fast. And you're still only limited on to certain basis that you can even file an appeal on. Well, obviously, yes. yes. I mean, we have to find we have to find appealable issues. We have to find where this judge abused discretion, where he didn't follow the law correctly, whatever the issue is. But uh, you don't denigrate the judge. I mean, the judge did the best job that he could under the circumstances, and that's why he he's in that position because the judge is there to treat everybody fairly. It is a tough time, I'll tell you, and uh, and maybe the pendulum has start to swing back. I think you look at so. So many of the policies that are that are were going to change, and now that he's had a chance to actually read the reasoning behind, it's softening in virtually every area, every claim that he made initially. So maybe this will be one that they'll also. I, I think the power has everything to do with California, and even though it didn't go Republican, there was a lot of money that came out of California agro business that went into the Trump campaign, and. They, more than anybody in the United States, need workers, and when it comes right down to it, the only place they're going to get them are undocumented workers. Has, has that bill come in front of the Governor Jerry Brown's desk to make post state of California sanctuary state? You know, I'm not. I was I think, actually I think watching a little bit about it because one of the Republican senators is already um, putting together a petition, a referendum against it, if it does pass. Um, I can't remember who it was, but yeah, it was on, uh, it was just on like CNN or Fox News or one of them last night they were talking about. But you know, you, you have that threat from the federal government that we're going to deprive you of, of federal money if you insist on being a sanctuary city or state or whatever. Uh, but, I mean, can they really, number one, they haven't done it. Jeff Sessions is talking, but he's not talking with any kind of authority that, that allows him to do it. And number two, what, are you gonna, what kind of money are you going to keep out? You know, California gets a billion dollars a day from the federal government if you combine all the programs. Nevada is number 50 of the states that gets money from the federal government. And, and California pays more money than anybody. Of course, they pay more money. And, and, money, yeah. and so if anybody wanted to walk away from anybody, it would be California walking away from the feds if things got too weird. It is a very, um, it's, a, it's a time of, um, of testing virtually everything that we thought that we knew about America and our fellow Americans to some extent. Um, and it, I, I think, you know, the one thing that, that always occurs to me is th this country is such a, such a potential for greatness. That we, this country has stood for so many wonderful things and been a savior to so many people. The idea that it can be torn or dirtied by, by disagreements that won't fade away. I hope, I hope that this, at some point, becomes a distant memory. I can't wait for that day. Well, you know, a few years ago, I had a, a very serious case of a person that was uh, severely beat and then left on the hot uh, driveway in Baker, California, in the middle of summer, uh, on their back, and then turned them over. And they were like they had been on a barbecue. This person was like they had been on a barbecue, and then he was in ICU never recovered from the coma and died. And so I brought a lawsuit against the California Highway Patrol and the trooper that did this. And uh, then we came to a point where we settled the case and because he had children, I had to ask the court's permission for some. And, and, and the court, and it's, this is a judge that travels and he's, I've had him here in Las Vegas. His name was Judge Quackenbush, very, very tough judge. And he said, you know, this isn't enough money. He said, I was going to reject your application to accept this settlement. But he said, then I thought back and I said, you know, we're here, we're in Riverside County, this is a Mexican, uh, or Mexican-American that did that. He said, I don't know what the jury would do. They might just penalize his family and say he shouldn't have been in this country in the first place and give them nothing. So he said, reluctantly, I'm going to have to accept the settlement. And so my point is that I was talking to an attorney last week and they were, she and her partner were, uh, or the partner was in trial. And I said, we're scared now. You know, we used to think that we wanted to have our cases tried by a jury of our peers. But we don't know our peers now because we, 
we can look at things one way, and now we're finding out that people can look at things completely different, and they think they're right. This is alternative facts. Yeah. And you go, do you ever want to have a jury trial again? I guess the bigger question for people considering this issue is, is whom do you trust? Is it Trump or is it Reagan? Those are very, very similar problems. Anybody who says that the dynamic has somehow changed, they're probably right. There are fewer uh, illegal aliens that are entering the country today than there were during Ronald Reagan's time. But Reagan took a, a, an entirely different view, and that was that if you're not causing problems, if you're not breaking the law, then perhaps there's some way that we can move forward, find a way to move forward. I hope that that day comes, that we can return to that sort of civil discourse. But I would say this, for anybody who wants to give serious consideration to immigration and you really, really want to do something and you, and you have this hate in your heart for these people, just remember this. If they take you at your word and they take the president as his word and they decide to stay home for a couple of weeks and you decide that you're hungry, just act in self-interest because this whole thing could come tumbling down very, very quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, don't, don't forget about self-interest. Don't forget your food comes from someplace, and I guarantee you that at some point or another, the majority of people who touch that food are immigrant workers who came here, quote, illegally, end quote. Yeah, watch that movie, it's A Day Without Mexicans. Have you seen that? I it's have. It's a comedy. It's yeah. interesting. Yeah. yeah. Okay, now i now I got something to watch. There you are. And with that, we call it a day. The Vegas Legal Podcast. I want to thank you so much. Thank, thank you, Mark. Thank you Appreciate so much. And uh, Tyler Morgan, publisher of Vegas Legal Magazine, thanks for doing the good work for bringing some new life to legal community. Jeff Haney, Vice President of Fiero Communications, the friendliest marketing firm in Las Vegas. David Purdy, Nerdy Purdy on the book. Probably out there with a story, a story idea, an axe to grind. Get old of Vegas Legal, the leading magazine in the Southern Nevada legal community. You can call Tyler at 702-222-3476. Reach out. Tell us, tell your friends, have a good one. We are out of here. And we